Bass player Robert and I met each other a few years back in uh, Long Beach, California um, at a place called Fender's Ballroom where there used to be a lot of punk rock shows. We actually met at a Black Flag concert and um, it turned out through the conversation, like through talking, after we figured out, you know, we both found that we were both musicians and um, we found that we were both seeing the same girl at the same time, which was a really strange thing and we kind of laughed about it. It wasn't any serious kind of relationship, you know, it was more of like, you know, I've been seeing, it's like, oh yeah, this girl I've been seeing, she lives over here, and it's like, you know, so does so there's a girl that I've been seeing, you know, as so I was like, what's her name? Uh, Michelle. And it like turned out really, it was strange, strange thing. But anyway, so um, at the time we were both kind of, I was living with my parents and he was kind of staying at, a, at one of his buddies' house doing the couch tour kind of thing. Uh, and so we said, well, this this girl happened to be having to move back to Texas where she was from because she was getting um, warrants in the mail. And, and that's, she split without telling her landlord. And in California, you, there's three months before you can actually evict someone out of a out of a um, uh, apartment. So we said, well, let's just take over. He's like, Robert's like, I, I got a key to her place. Let's take over there. The manager doesn't even live on the premises. So we said, like, okay, we'll stay there as long as we can, we can stay. So we hung out there and um, and just sort of started writing little weird things on his mini eight-track recorder, like uh, twisted mental, like kind of commercial jingle things. Um the one that stands to mind the most was this thing we did about a product that we came up with called Dr. Lymph Nodes Duck Butter Brand Butt Wax. And this sick, crazy little things like that. Robert's from New Jersey, so he's got that, that really mental sort of East Coast humor. Um, but then we ended up saying, like, you know, we really should, like, uh, try to put some kind of musical project together. I listened to a lot of the music that Robert had written himself, just instrumentally, and um, all the different sort of influences that he had growing up with were caused you know him to really have a unique style in writing. I mean, some of his stuff would would sound like have a progressive kind of twinge to it, from like a Kim Kring Kim. Crimson-ish feel than to something really, you know, heavy and sludgy like a Black Sabbathy kind of thing, and I myself, um, not growing up, listening to at first to a lot of the whole like you know, heavy rock and roll thing. So I really can't claim to that. I can't say I sat around in a dark room sh and shot dope and listened to Led Zeppelin too much. Um, Actually, the first band I ever really got into was uh, my parents went to a Beatlemania concert and brought me back a live concert album, so I played the thing like day and night. You know, I was thinking, geez, these guys write great songs. Um, but uh, anyway, so Robert and I got this band together, and we said, like, well, we need a drummer. You know, we were at the time just screwing around, you know, writing a few ideas. So we went out to a club. We well, actually went out to a few clubs. We didn't want to put an ad in the paper because you get a lot of morons that way, you know, saying like, "Oh yeah, I can do this, I can do that." But we went went to this um this this small club, and uh, there was a band playing that really sucked. But um, the drummer of the band hit the drums so hard that he was like playing louder than the rest of everybody else. I mean, it wasn't. It was a kind of stage volume kind of thing where the only thing was Mike was vocals. But the guy just was playing as loud as he could and and didn't care that he was, like, you know, covering up and, and totally overshadowing everybody else. And we were saying, like, we should get this guy in our band. You know, this guy's really, this guy, he, he he's like, you can't hear the singer and he doesn't even care. Um, 
So we asked her, talked to Eric about it. Said, well, let's go do some demos together. You know, we got an A-track. Let's do some demos. Problem was guitar players. At the time, at that time, we were looking for guitar players. The only good guitar players were already taken up in bands, and it seemed everyone was into this total cheese ball, Ingve Malmstein kind of like, oh, let's see what I can do. You know, look at me masturbate. You know what I mean with, with my guitar kind of thing. Um, and we really were looking for someone that had a lot more soul with their playing and and didn't look at guitar as just you know with tunnel vision looked at it like you know as a way to express all kinds of different you know moods and atmospheres and that and Dean, and Robert actually kept on saying we should get my brother come out from Jersey they're both from New Jersey originally um, and uh, so finally Dean said okay I'll come out just you know do these demos you know I need a vacation anyway um, And so Dean comes out, we do a couple demos together, and everything goes really well. And uh, he decides to stay. We decide, like, well, let's do, let's, we should, we should do this, you know. We've always wanted, that's all we've ever really wanted to do, all of us, was do music, and this seemed like a great chance, you know. I mean, rather than doing the trial and error, like, being 99 different bands, you know what I mean, um, let's really try to do something with this. So Dean met somebody and um, I met, met a girl who lived in San Diego and he moved down to San Diego and uh, we basically started doing most of our live playing down there because the whole, at that time the whole LA scene really was really kind of an anal atmosphere, you know, I mean, bands just got together, came from all over just to try to get, like, the big deal, you know, and, and so they're all writing songs, like, just to try to get the big deal, and you have, like, local people that, like, work, all they all work, like, uh, in their, you know, record store, clothing store jobs, like, on Melrose, and they all, you know, it's this whole, like, kind of, like, scene thing that we really didn't want to, you know, jump into, and, and, you know, embrace as what we're about. So we kind of honed our our live playing for the most part in San Diego. Playing some show, playing of course, playing sh some shows in L.A. because I was living in the area. Um, and uh, as far as getting together, that's basically how we got together. So how, what's what's the name? How would you pick the name? Um, at at. First, for a while, we were called uh, called ourselves Mighty Joe Young. Um, when I was a kid, we used to. I used to when I was a kid, I lived in actually in Cleveland. We used to drive with, to my great aunt's house in Evanston, Illinois. I remember for Thanksgiving, and being bored, I sat around and watched a lot of you know Thanksgiving um, holiday TV. And Mighty Joe Young seemed to be on every single Thanksgiving. It was like one of those things, like, on, I forgot, it was on, like, 4th of July, they play Twilight Zone, like, like, hour after hour all day long. Well, it was Mighty Joe Young was on every Thanksgiving, and that we ended up adopting that name. But we had to lose the name because, uh, there's an old blues cat in, um, in, uh, Chicago, we found out who goes by Mighty Joe Young, and he'd been do, you know, going by Mighty Joe Young ever since he started making um, records, even on his little independent label. Um, at the time, we didn't think it would really make much of a difference. The guy was really old, you know, hadn't really done anything, you know, and uh, so we get done doing the record and all, and, and actually it was the day we had a little informal listening party just for... Um, some friends and for uh, some people over at um, Atlantic, and we get a phone call from our from our uh, from our manager saying, um, "Eric Greenspan just called me, who's our attorney. We're gonna have to change the name." And we're like, oh, "Steve, you're just joking, right?" And he's like, "No, serious. We're gonna have to change the name." Um, this guy, Mighty Joe Young, I don't know what the deal is, but. Maybe he's like cancer's in a remission or something, or maybe he like clawed his way out of his grave or whatever, but he's on a big blues festival this summer. 
and we're like, right, great. So we went through like a little period of time trying to change the name, thinking of different names and that, and um, the first thing that stuck in mind for me was, um, that I really liked was, I just I got this vision of my old first bicycle that I ever had when I was a kid, and on the bicycle, on the big banana seat, like every other kid my age, I, I had this big STP sticker that, you know, everybody had at the time, you know, big STP stickers, you stick it on your wall right next to, like, your, you know, Bay City Rollers poster or something. And I thought, well, this is a cool thing, you know. This is a really that 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 that's amazing, you know. If if Andy Warhol were alive, you know, he would think that is like, you know, complete total, you know, pop art, you know, genius. But anyway, it seemed like a cool idea, and um, but we had to think of something to uh, that it that it meant. And first, we were kind of partial to. Shirley Temple's pussy, but um, we were advised that that might not be taken so well, so we said, okay, well, then um, Stone Temple Pilots seemed to fit really well, um, because it was kind of like a contradiction, like all of us are, like everybody is, I mean, everybody basically, when you think about it, it's kind of like a contradiction, you know, you'll, be, you'll act in this certain way, and you'll stand by this thing, but yet you're like... 30 minutes later you'll go and and do something that totally contradicts what you're actually about or what you say but the whole thing is kind of actually it was somebody that after we already picked the name um, brought up the fact that you know hey, now did you pick that name because it's like sort of representative towards your sound I mean you got this heavy sound but then sometimes you have this light ethereal sound so it's kind of like stone temple pilots kind of like you know soars and we're like no but thanks man that that helps out you know I'll say that in, in an interview or something but uh in actuality we're we're we're, we're more partial more fond of uh, of the new name in a way it feels like that is what we're, we are. That is the name of the band. Um, and we don't have to worry about the bothersome comparison to uh, that other band that has the Joe in their name. We don't need to mention that. No. So let's, uh, if, if, you weren't a, if you weren't a musician, you know, uh, what do you think you'd want to do? What were the fantasies as a, as a kid? Um, besides every other kid, at the time that probably grew up ar around the late 60s, was born in the late 60s and grew up through the 70s, that ever drank um, Ovaltine or any of those, what was that orange drink again? Tang. Tang, yeah. I wanted uh, to be an astronaut. I mean, everyone wanted to be an astronaut. And I guess in a sense, like being a musician is... It's kind of close to being an astronaut. Um, now, it, I, I don't know. If, if I, as I thought when I started, I actually started going after from high school, went a couple of years um, to, to college before I decided that they didn't have um, classes on teaching you how to be a successful recording artist, really, or whatever you want to say they didn't have like rock star like 120 or anything like that um uh I, I was actually taking a lot of literature classes in that and um because i like books so i think that if my musical career has a short life then i would probably act be into being a teacher, I think. What, uh, where, where do you think you find your, uh, your lyrical inspiration? You write the lyrics by yourself, or, or yeah, you? L lyrically. Yeah. What, what, uh, are you one of these uh, lyricists who kind of goes to sleep and has, wakes up in the middle of the night with with a dream or a series of words, or um, tell me about your, you know, the process of writing lyrics and uh, some is it a painful process or is it a, 
a joyful process. It's actually a joyful process, even though even the the songs that have a more um, even the ones that have a, a darker sort of feel to them actually are even writing those songs is more of a pleasurable kind of it's a pleasurable situation because it's almost like letting demons out of the closet in a way um, it's like when you have a it's like anything, you know, when you have something that's on your mind that, that is, like, bothering you. Sometimes to be able to, like, talk to somebody about it, you know, talk about it or whatever, kind of feels like you're cleansed, you know, and, and, and you're, you feel better, you know, better about it. Um, as far as the process of, ri of writing them, when I get a lot of ideas, a lot of the times the ideas I get or the things I write don't even turn into songs. I've I've got like a whole scrapbook of of uh cocktail napkins that have um different poems or just little phrases and stuff that I that I write. A lot of times I like to go out a lot by myself. Um for one reason I like to watch people and watch how people interact with other people. I, I think that's really entertaining. A lot of times I have a better time going out by myself and just watching people, observing people, than than going out with, you know, friends or or even with my girlfriend. She doesn't quite understand that that much. But um, so sometimes I'll be sitting there, like at 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 um, a bar that I one of my favorite home away from home places um like there's a place called smalls in in hollywood that i go to in the early hours and it's really kind of empty and it's cool and just keep on bothering like uh like jim and the bartender jim can i have another like napkin let me buy your pen again and i'll just like keep on writing stuff down in there and the like even if it's like a word sometimes a word will give me a, a a feeling or an idea a couple of words about like what the vi the, you know give a certain kind of it's like painting a, the whole the background of a painting you know what i mean you can already see what the mood is going to be and then it's just like actually putting it all down all down um and uh, that's where i usually come up with a lot of more obscure kind of stuff the more obscure internal weird tweet kind of stuff um, but then again sometimes it'll come from an experience of of somebody else like in the band there's a couple songs on the on the record that uh, were actually observations of um, of uh, Robert's um, relationship situation at the time um, was kind of a very violent, angry kind of situation and, and that influenced me a lot because we're, we were really close as a band and um, so there would be a song written and I could tell like automatically like for instance the song Sin um, when Ro Robert actually wrote all the music to that song um, for the, most, for the most part, we collaborate a lot, you know, instrumentally, musically, w with what's going on. But Robert's a brilliant writer, and sometimes when he'll write a song, he'll just write the song, and it's done, and, and it, there's no need for anybody to feel like there needs to be any kind of collaboration, except for maybe, like, the arrangement, you know. For, like, the song Sin, Robert wrote the song, and uh, we brought it to rehearsal one time, and... Uh, within the first couple minutes of playing the song I was jamming through it I started singing the, a melody and when we decided this song definitely has got to go on the record I wrote the lyrics and I and I knew I knew when I first heard the song what he was right what he wrote the, even just the music itself about 
I could just I could feel exactly what he was talking about when I wrote the lyrics. He like looked at me. We looked straight in, the, in each other's eyes, and he and it was, and he he knew that I it was a it was a real strange, real strange feeling. He knew that I had totally, you know, made that connection from where he was coming from. I think it's easier uh, as a singer to sing lyrics that that you've written. Def yeah, definitely. Um, I would have I don't know if this is self-serving or or um. I don't know if it, it it's a a big headed thing to say or but I would have a hard time feeling emotional about writing about singing lyrics um that someone else had had written and given me unless it was something that I you know from Unless it was something that I really felt strongly about, you know, myself as well. Um, I mean, there's a couple, like, cover ideas, you know, that we've, you know, cover songs that we've, you know, enjoyed doing that are fun to do. But that, that's more from a performance standpoint. It's it's less of an emotional kind of thing. Um, but for the most part, I, I feel more comfortable uh, singing songs that, that I... The lyrics that I've written myself. So this is actually is this your first band? Um, Tell me about your own performance experiences uh, previous previous to this uh, unit. Well, however nerdy it may sound, um, when I was in um, high school, I didn't seem to really fit in too well with the. Uh, I can't. I actually went to high school in Orange County in Southern California, and I really didn't fit in too well with with the crowd that was like the popular soch kind of like crowd. Really, you know, um, the football players, you know, that like walk into you know a party all big and bloated with you know. A, 12 pack of Coors Light under their arm, you know, walking in and um so I always loved music ever since I was like in elementary school. I remember actually actually in elementary school I was even sang in choir and and I sang the in the Christmas concert for the school and for parents I sang um the solo uh Oh Hanukkah, oh Hanukkah, da 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 da. Um, I forgot the name of the song, but you know what song I'm talking about, right? Tannenbaum. Tannenbaum. Yeah, like, that's exactly it. Yeah, it was been a lot. That was actually in first grade. Um, and so in high school, I I sang in uh in the the choir. Which isn't like when you're in high school the like coolest thing to really do, but I really enjoyed it. You know, um, got to sing a lot of different stuff, a lot of stuff that was in Italian, a lot of stuff that was in Latin and in German, um, like the Brahms Liebeslieder waltzes, or they actually say Liebeslieder waltzer. Um, but then again, you know, I was also at that time. In to uh, a different kind of music. Everybody at that time seemed to be into like Prince and Michael Jackson and uh, cheesy people like you know B Billy Idol and that. And um, I was m more into um, punk rock music at that time and at my school in Huntington Beach you know people that were into punk rock like for the, the for the like the social crowd thing were like oh those guys are losers those guys are losers so I kind of started with some friends of mine um, a band that was the spin-off of a band called Awkward Positions we were sort of the Awkward Positions 2 version um, 
with my best friend, uh, Corey Hickok, um, a couple other guys. And, uh, played at that kind of thing for a while in my garage, you know, pissed off all the neighbors. And, um, but, you know, actually, it was around that time, though, that I really realized that, you know, I'm going to school and all that, you know, and that's, that's cool, you know. Got to go to school. Parents don't really like it when you don't go to school. So, tried to go to school as much as possible, played in the band, and, uh, then I got, when I was in high school, I actually was going through that teenage kind of like, you know, parents and me don't get along so well kind of time. So one of those, one of those like, uh, hospital unit places, my parents like talked to a counselor, which is a whole complete, that whole industry is such a heist. I mean, you know, they sucker parents who are like freaked out about their kids, like going, you know, going through that normal teen kind of deal and they tell you your kid's fucked up in the head and he's you know he's on drugs and that kind of shit you know and sure i'd experiment with drugs i experimented with drugs and you know i you know drank beer and whatever like just like everybody else does but anyway so i get sent away to a a, a mental hospital called brea mental hospital for like three weeks and then from there to this something like like care unit ward kind of place for like kids that are all fucked up thing. And I was there for th actually for three months. Um, needless to say, how my parents and I get along great now and everything is fine. And I don't think there's been a word mentioned about that whole section of my life like ever since then. What your parents do? What were, you, what were they what, professionals? Yeah. Professionals? Yeah. I mean, this was Orange County. We're talking. This was Reagan country at that time, man. Let's go on. Let's uh, let, let's put your band in a perspective of the history of rock and roll. Where do you guys see yourselves musically? Uh, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not saying that, that you guys think you're you're, you're, you're uh, maybe you do. Maybe you think you're you know, you're onto something something new or special. But where do you see yourself in the in the realm stylistically? And uh, well, I think it's hard for any band to really do anything that is completely, you know. Um, completely new because, you know, rock and roll's been around for, you know, years and years and years and years now and there are only so many notes, you know, in the scale, only so many different keys, but I think what makes something, you know, unique and interesting now is if people are writing music that really comes from, you know, your soul and from your heart, you know, and, and, and from your mind as well, you know, rather than doing, uh, conceding to the whole formula, you know, and doing this whole homogenized kind of thing that, like, you know, where people think, well, you know, I can get a record deal doing this, and they'll, they'll play me on the radio, you know. But, I don't know, I think that right now the state of music is great, it's getting much better just because things seem to go in trends, you know. Um, everything goes in trends. Art goes in trends. Architecture goes in trends. Um, business goes in trends. Everything goes in trends. I mean... Sex goes in trends, you know. I mean, th some things influence it, like A's, you know. Suddenly, everyone's wearing rubbers, you know. Um, uh, but um, I think right now, for the first time in a in a lot of years, for the most part, you know, this is not to say oh, completely this is everything, but I think for the most part, a lot of the music that's coming out right now, I think will be is some of the first music in a really long time that will be considered classic ten years from now. Um, and the reason why is because it's, go back to the trend thing, the, the generation, like, my generation of people, like, I'd say anywhere from, like, 18 to, you know, you know, not to exclude or, you know, or include for any wrong as anyone, I'd say, like, you know, the whole, 
I don't know. There, there's so many names for what they're calling our generation. I don't, you know, that that whole for 18 to like, you know, 30 kind of thing for the most part. At P, are, are a bunch of kids who've grown up, <clears throat> you know, through the whole uh, Reagan facade and the whole, you know, with, with so much like suppression and oppression, racially, environmentally, everything that you know they're looking forward. Looking, looking ahead to the future and saying, "Man, you know, this sucks. I, I don't, I don't. This, w there doesn't seem to be anything that great to look forward to. You know, like my parents told me when I was a kid. And so I think um, that people, that, that kids, and I say kids. I don't mean kids like you know, little kids on big wheels. I mean you know, young people." are into like relating to things that they're attracted to music that that they relate to with their own feelings you know things that like you know mirror their kinds of of uh of thoughts and their kinds of frustrations and it, not just angry music but like pe people are like into being <clears throat> having a more of an open mind because we've been told for so long to not have an open mind you know you know it's like anything you tell someone not to do something and they want to do it so you're having kids that are a lot more into to things that are more openly real and in and, and, and more into art again and stuff you know so you have anywhere from you have people like into music you know from the extremes of like bands like you know Rollins and ministry and and you know real heavy stuff like that uh and that are also more into more experimental like ethereal kind of th bands you know uh artists like like lush and stuff you know it's just and that's like a trend i mean and it it's not saying a trend like trendy you know but things are moving in a direction and you can even see it within the whole corporate conglomerate monster of the music industry i mean there's people that are coming to work even in the music industry that grew up through the whole through college through the whole 80s like college radio thing that were you know into a more liberal liberating free open you know more artistic kind of you know kind of uh kind of thing and so a lot of these people are, are you know slowly infiltrating into you know the music industry um, and in the film industry, you know, so that's really good. You know, that makes it better because there's no way that even four years ago, even three years ago, that a band like our band could have, you know, would have gotten signed, you know, with, without putting out any other records of our own to, you know, a major label. Um, <clears throat> we didn't actually didn't even think about <clears throat> shopping. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> We actually didn't even think about shopping to a, or trying to attract attention of a major label at first. We thought of, first of all, you know, well, let's just, you know, we're ready to start recording some records, you know. Well, let's, you know, SST is cool. Let's check out SST or, you know. So it just gets you, you by surprise that, that uh, a major label would have picked you up so quickly? Um, yeah, it was actually a strange thing, and it was like a little scary at first, but there were a few reasons why. We um, decided to do it. For one, um, we were seen at a club in Hollywood um, called Club with No Name, which used to be uh, Scream. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, at uh, it's, it's like an underground club. It's every Monday night. We were seen there by Don Muller, um, who is uh, an agent over at Triad. And Don works closely with a lot of bands, a lot of really cool bands. Um, uh, he's actually one of the people that, one of the the three, I guess, co-president people of the whole Wallapalooza Productions. He, he's one the, the three people that put that whole thing together, and he, you know, represents bands from like you know Nirvana to I. I Beastie Boys, you know, bands that are, you know, really cool, good bands that are, you know, into doing what they're doing. Um, and he saw us and said, and called, 
uh, Tom Carolyn over at Atlantic, who they went through college together in, I believe it was Iowa, one of those, like, Midwest, like, flatland, crazy states where brothers and sisters marry each other and weird things like that. Um, but called up Tom Carroll and said, you know, I saw this band, this, this, they're a really good band, you should check them out, you know. So Tom called up our manager, Steve, and uh, we um, we went, we had breakfast with them, and, and uh, which he paid, of course, which was kind of cool. It's like, wow, someone's buying me breakfast. This is kind of cool. But with, in actuality, to be to be serious about it, what was what was uh, a, what was a, the cool thing about it was um, at the same time they were wanting to sign us. Um, Atlantic has n had no other band on their whole roster that that was in this the kind of thing that we're about. You know, they're for the most part were real contemporary. Uh, rock bands, you know, lots of hair and, you know, lots of tight, shiny pants and that whole kind of thing. Um, but Danny Goldberg, who had his own management company, Gold Mountain Entertainment, um, was, we found it was to be coming on as to head up the West Coast. And that was really attractive to us because Danny, as a manager, had been working with, you know, or underground bands for a long time. Like, he'd been working with Nirvana for, you know, like, near the beginning with the Beastie Boys and, you know, and others. And <clears throat> so we, we knew that he understood the whole, you know, kind of grassroots thing that we knew that we would, you know, have to, that we were about. And that Atlantic was going to be going through some changes, you know, um, changing how the way that they, uh, their department worked in that. So timing-wise, it, it turned out to be a good thing. Um, the year, when was this? How long? When we actually got signed. Uh, we actually signed, I think it was uh, the end of March. It'll be a year coming? Coming this March, yeah. So the record got out pretty quick or the record had already been done? No, the record, we did the record um, with uh, our producer, Brendan O'Brien, who... Before you got signed? You had no, a, no, we did it after, yeah. We recorded it in about three and a half weeks, actually. Just really it reminds me, because uh, i got to stop, but uh, <coughs> you, it kind of reminds me what Steppenwolf may have sounded like if, if they were still recording. Wow, that's a great, that's, 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 a, that's a great not compliment. Every, not every song, but, but many of the songs, I think, vocally, attitude-wise... Uh, um, did obviously it comes to you by as, by as a surprise. Who do you think you're closest to as a, as, as, as a vocalist? Um, you know, I hear all kinds of things different but times. For yourself, yeah. who, you know, who are your uh, s singing singing heroes? Because obviously, every artist has has roots and and right. pers personal connections to 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 other singers. You may never sound like them, but there got there has to be some kind of you know. If you do, at least I think if one right. isn't. An, one doesn't acknowledge that, then they're either bullshitting or they have no idea what, what's influenced them. Right, exactly. Um, for yourself, what, what, what I would you, I would definitely who say you closest to <clears throat> singers that I really admire, um, which I'm sure have had influence on me. Would probably say uh, Joe Cocker was definitely an influence. Um, James Brown. I'd have to say it was uh, an influence, and um, I mean, however typically it may sound, um, I have to say uh, Jim Morrison, um, for the sake that possibly we have the same sort of lower vocal kind of register, and uh, lyrically when I was a kid, that was probably one of the only like rock bands that that I really listened to because my parents really weren't into my parents weren't 60s hippies my parents my parent nothing against my parents I love my parents but uh they weren't exactly 
raising me on Jimi Hendrix and uh, and that kind of stuff. I think my first album I ever got was Captain and Tennille, Love Will Keep Us Together. They were the so. Marilyn, Marilyn Quayle Americans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. I, we gotta stop.